Jesus, my heavenly King, loves me, I know. Praises to him I cling, onward I go. Closely to him I cling, blessings still flow. I love my Savior too. You know that I love my Savior. He loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. I see his favor in everything I do. Walking with him each day, love life doth shine. Doing his will always, never repine. Kneeling to him, I pray thy will, not mine. You know that I love my Savior too. You know that I love my Savior. He loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. I seek his favor in everything I do. You know that I love my Savior. He loves me too. Yes, he loves me too. I seek his favor in everything I do. We are grateful to the God of heaven who never makes a mistake for the wonderful privilege to be in the house of God. And that we're privileged to study out of the greatest book in the world, the Bible. Amen. We appreciate those who are present in person, and we are grateful for those who are listening online by means of Facebook and YouTube. We want you to know that your support your attendance mean a lot. And we are grateful that you have chosen once again to study the Word of God. Amen. Tonight we are studying from Galatians chapter 6. And the verse of emphasis is verse number 17. This is the last chapter of the book that Paul wrote to the church at Galatia. He starts out in chapter 6 by instructing them to bear ye one another's burdens. What a challenge. Secondly, he talks about do not become weary in well-doing. And as you and I face all of the ramification, all of the adjustments trying to survive in this coronavirus pandemic, we must not become weary in well-doing. But hold on to God's unchanging hands. And then he talks about the motives of circumcision. And he says it is of no value. And he concludes the last four or five verses by talking about the motives of him as an apostle. Let's read, starting with verse 14.
But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be unto them, and mercy, and upon the Israel of God. For from henceforth, let no man think and trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Verse 17 again. The B portion. For I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Tonight, I want to emphasize in this section the identifying marks of Christians. The identifying marks of Christians, contextually and exegetically, the apostle suffered for the Lord Jesus Christ. And the physical results of persecution, he had marks, scars, wounds, that identified him as having suffered for the Lord Jesus Christ. Beware of the religious leader who lives in his ivory tower, knowing nothing of having to battle against the world of sin, the flesh, the devil, who has not any marks to show for his obedience to Christ Jesus. Paul was not an armchair general. He was out on the front line waging war against sin and taking his share of suffering. This is doubtless a reference to the scars of suffering in Paul's being stoned at Lystra. And among these, their regulations on his first tour. He considered such marks as positive and undeniable evidence of his genuineness of his apostleship. The marks that branded Paul as a slave for Jesus Christ were deep cuts from rods at Pisidia, Antioch, the stones that were cast at Lystra. At Lystra, Paul was stoned and dragged out of the city 
and left out there for dead. Here was a man for 25 years or more was traveling up and down the Roman Empire as a globe-trotting missionary, sailing, walking, and riding. Look at the labels on his baggage. Tarsus, Damascus, Antioch, all of this for Jesus Christ. Look at him, preaching, teaching, arguing, defending, and explaining the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ in many strange and hostile forums. No family, enemies, suspicion attacked, placed in jail, and deserted. But he kept on preaching and teaching the Word of God. Amen. 25 years or more, he was a soldier on the battlefield for my Lord. Cold shoulders by some church people where he had planted and loved, talked about unkindly by people whom he had taught about the Lord Jesus Christ, people whom he had baptized. In the University of Hard Knocks, he got marks Marks, Marks, I ask you tonight, as you and I think about the Marks physically that the Apostle Paul suffered, do you have any Marks that identify you as a child of God? All that live godly shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3.12 Mark 5 and 12 says Rejoice in persecution. 1 Peter 4.16 If any man suffer as a Christian let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Think for a moment. All of the apostles were martyred except one. Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned to death. James, the son of Zebedee, beheaded ten years later. Philip, scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Matthew, the former tax collector, suffered martyrdom in AD, AD 60. James, the brother of the Lord, at the age of 94, was beaten and stoned by the Jews Finally, his brain dashed out with a club. Marx, Andrew, Peter's brother, crucified on a cross. Mark was dragged to pieces by the people of Alexandria. Peter, crucified upside down. Paul, executed by Nero, beheaded, and Dr. Luke hang on an olive tree by the idolatrous people of Greece. John, 
the only apostle who escaped a violent death. When we think about the marks of these apostles, the little stuff that we go through makes us feel that we're not doing anything whatsoever. Now, tonight, I want to use the word mark in a metaphorical sense. And I'm not suggesting that anyone cut himself, abuse his body in some way to get a mark. We are suggesting this in a metaphorical sense, according to the Word of God. There are definite characteristics that identify the authentic Christian that distinguish him from the unconverted. The marks will cause him to stand out as being different, unique, peculiar, and special. There are marks which identify those who are true, sincere, dedicated, and committed to Jesus Christ. There are three marks I'd like to talk about tonight that identify us as Christians. Number one, if you continue in my word. Hello? In John 8, 33, Jesus then said Jesus to those Jews who believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples. Discipleship depends on your heeding to the word of God, obeying the word of God, and continuing to allow the word of God to guide and direct your life. The word of God is to have absolute direction in our lives in discipleship regarding the decisions that you make in life. Regarding in the lifestyle you live, the word of God should guide you regarding the companion you choose to marry. The word of God should guide you in your attitudes that you have. In the relationship that you choose, the Word of God ought to be the standard by which you abide. And the Word of God is the way in which you worship God. You remember John 4, 24, don't you? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So the word of God should have a direct influence upon all of us at all of the time. Not when you're just in the church house. Not when it is easy to obey the word of God. And not just when it is convenient but always, continually, consistently. Listen how David put it in Psalms 119 and verse 11. 
thy word. And have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Jesus says, you are my disciples if you continue in my word. It's not enough to get baptized. Don't come back to church services anymore. That's not enough. It's not enough to start out with a lot of fire, enthusiasm, and excitement, kicking up a lot of dust. And six weeks later, you know where to be found. Going back to the flesh pots of Egypt, to the beggarly elements of the world, that's not discipleship. He says, you got to continue in my word. And my brothers and sisters, you cannot continue in the word unless you know the word. And the only way you're going to know the word is to be taught the word of God. And that's why services are so essential. That's why Bible classes are so important. That's why workshops and seminars, gospel meetings are all venues that preach and teach the Word of God. And it's pathetic that so many Christians will not even take advantage of these teaching opportunities to help them to know the Word of God. But they can be uh, available for Netflix. They can be available for football games. Help me, somebody. They can be available for basketball games, but they are not available to study the Word of God. Shame on you. And you're talking about you are a faithful Christian. You ought to quit lying. Hello? Jesus, I need some help in here. I I feel the vibration that somebody is fixing to get mad. Well, if you're fixing to get mad, that's the devil in you. Help me, somebody. The Word of God is important. The Word of God Is like a piercing sword. It's quick and powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews 4.12 Word of God will cut us going and coming. The Word of God is a reflecting mirror. All of us ought to look into the Word of God and see how we look in the sight of Almighty God. We look and check our faces and our hair, trying to dress properly and make sure our appearances are okay. But outward appearances are not enough. What about your inward appearances? How do you look in the mirror? The Word of God. The Word of God It's a burning fire of conviction. You remember Jeremiah decided to quit preaching, said he was not going to prophesy anymore in the name of the Lord. But he said his word was as a burning fire. Shut up in my bones, and I was weary, and I could not stay. You know, the Word of God ought to, ought to shake us up. The Word of God ought to remind us that we're wrong when we're wrong. Help me, somebody. The Word of God will pierce our conscience, and it will pound our lives like a hammer. And God's word is a guiding light 
Thank God it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathway. How many of you, as a Christian, are continuing in the discipleship? Continuing, not having fallen by the wayside. God's word is our guide for the earth to glory. Don't start out and fall by the wayside. The race is not given to the swift, but the race is given to the one who endures. How long? Until the end. Ye are my disciples, as Jesus said. And he uses a large word and only has two letters, if you continue in my words. Every Christian ought to have that mark. Do you have it? Secondly, every Christian ought to have the mark of loving one another. Amen. Oh, praise his name. Every Christian ought to have a mark of love, loving one another. In John 13, verses 34 and 35, notice what the Word of God says. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that you love also one another. By this, by this, shall all men know that you are my disciples. Here comes that big word again. If you have love one to another, if you and I have love one for another, it makes a world of difference. It doesn't matter how long you have been a member of the Church of Christ, how much love do you have? It does not matter how faithful you are in attending the services. How much love do you have? Have you ever remember reading the 13th chapter of First Corinthians? Paul said, if I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profiteth me nothing. If I can speak with the tongues of angels and have not love, it does not profit me anything. By this all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. You may have a great voice and sing in one of our choral groups, sing loud and long, but honey child, if you don't have love, what does it profit? If you don't have love, real genuine love, Christ-like love, in your heart, one for another, then you are not a faithful child of God. Amen? Amen. And when a Christian has the love of Christ in his heart, 
he will not be difficult to get along with. Hello? He will not be critical of everything that happens. He will not be judgmental of other people. People come down front and say, I have said, well, what did he do? That's none of your business. Well, he keeps on coming down every Sunday. Well, you ought to come down every Sunday. Stop being judgmental. See two people talking together of opposite sex. Well, I think they're going with each other. You got the devil in your mind. Don't be judgmental. Christ like love will not encourage a person or allow a person to be rude and cruel in his disposition. If anybody ought to have a pleasant disposition and a pleasant personality, it ought to be a child of God. Come on, I'm a faithful Christian and going around here hating folk. You know, you're not a faithful Christian. You're just fooling yourself. And it's child, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget what you've done. That's not love. Preach for the Lord. Christ, like love, will not be a trouble instigator. A lot of folk like to start trouble, throw rocks, and hide their hand, and then try to look so holy, so innocent. But God knows our hearts. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, he shall also reap. You are my disciples if you have love one for another. When you really love the Lord, you will not be easily offended. Some folk are too sensitive. Easily hurt. Easily offended. But look at Paul. Over 25 years, he globetrotted the Roman Empire and got scars and marks in his physical body. Stoned at Lystra, dragged out of the city, and left out there for being dead. dead. But glory be to God, he got up and went on back in that city and preached the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Marks! Shipwreck, stone, beaten with rods. But none of that caused him to have a bad disposition. But it increased his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need more love in the church. If there is real love, hear me now, hear me, hear, 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 hear me now. There will be no false accusations made. Don't be accusing folk and talking about stuff you'd know nothing about. Hello? There will be no corruption a corrupt communication coming out of your mouth. No malice gossip will be repeated. No bitter attitudes expressed. And no immoral behavior will be participated in. Listen to what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 verses 3 and 4. You have your Bible turned to Philippians 
the two, three, and four. And Paul says, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Marvelous instruction. By this, all men shall know that you are my disciples. He wrote again in Galatians 3, 12 and 13. Galatians 3, 12 and 13. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a call against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Is that the way you live? Even as Christ forgave you, Paul said, oh, so also do ye. And I want to tell you, love and commandments go together. John 14 and 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So love is to be demonstrated in our lives. And that identifies one as one of the marks of being a Christian. Continue in the word, first of all, and then love. You know one thing, I've never seen a church anywhere in the world that had too much love. But I've seen some that didn't have enough love. And the love of a congregation begins with each individual. Do your part as a child of God. And last of all, the third identifying mark as a disciple or as a Christian, you must bear fruit. I'm not talking about apples and oranges. But you must bear fruit. John 15 and 8, listen to what the Bible says. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Isn't that an identifying mark? You got to bear much fruit. Fruit bearing is a definite mark of discipleship. There is more to a fruit tree than branches, leaves, and blossoms. There must be fruit. And if the tree is not productive and beneficial, the tree does not bear fruit for its own purposes, but for others. Every faithful Christian must be a godly person with godly influence in the lives of others. 
Now what kind of fruit should you bear? Should you bear? Since you can't bear oranges and pineapples and peaches, help me somebody. Well, take a look in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. If you want to know what kind of fruit that you must bear, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. How many of these fruits do you have in your life? How many of you need to work on some of the fruit that you do have? They're not ripe yet. They're still green. Help me, somebody. But you got to work on it. As Peter said, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness and brotherly kindness and charity or love. And Peter says, if these things be in you and abound, ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. Some of us need to develop more fruit. And these characteristics that are pointed out, the fruit of the Spirit. I believe that these characteristics are to be reflected in your everyday life. And they will reveal the, the kind of person you really are. You know, these kind of fruit will cause you to comfort those who are lonely, inspire those who are discouraged. These kind of fruits will cause you to help those who are helpless, cheer those who are sad, lift those who are fallen, and calm those who are frustrated. The life of a Christian is reflected how he lives. And every one of us as a child of God ought to bear some marks of spiritual characteristic that we are children of God and that will reflect the love of Almighty God. The Bible speaks of Christians and Christians only. In Acts 4.12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none of the name given among men under heaven, whereby we must be saved. What name is that? That name is Christian. Yes, sir. And that name is mentioned three times in the Bible. Acts 11, 26. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Acts 26, 28, Paul stood before Agrippa, and Agrippa said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. But the Bible closes. Without ever recording where Agrippa became a Christian. And the last time the word Christian is mentioned in the Bible is 1 Peter 4:16. We have referred to it already. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. Revised Standard Version. There were no different kinds of Christians in the Bible. Somebody says, I'm a Christian, but I'm this kind and that kind. That's not in the Bible. 
And all the Christians in the Bible were members of the same church. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 6. God reconciles everybody into one body. The Lord does not have many churches. Every time the Lord saves an individual, you know what he does? He adds him to his church. He doesn't join. He doesn't tarry for the Holy Ghost. He doesn't get down and pray for pardon and calling on the name of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. And he does not repeat no sinner's prayer. What must an individual do in order to become a Christian? Five simple things. And I'm glad they're simple because the Lord has a whosoever will invitation, let him come. You come by hearing the word of God. Romans 10, 17, blessed are they that hear the word of God. So then faith, rather, cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to hear the gospel. Jesus died for you. He was buried in Joseph's brand new tomb. But early Sunday morning, God raised him from the dead, never to die again. Oh, praise his name. You got to believe that. John 8, 24, except you believe that I'm he, you die in your sin. And if you die and you send the Lord says what I am, you cannot come. And then you repent of your sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5. I tell you, nay. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And then you make that great confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, 37. And go down, way down in the water, the grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. Acts 2, 38. And the Lord will add you to his church, Acts 2, 47. You'll be born again, John 3 and 5, and you are a child of God. Isn't it grand to be a Christian? Somebody ought to say, yes, it is. Yes, it is. And you can do that tonight. Get on the telephone and call the Church of Christ in your area and tell the person who answered that you want to become a Christian. No prefixes, no suffixes, no affixes, just simply a Christian. I hope there is somebody tonight who is tired of man-made doctrine, tired of living by the sinful drumbeats of Satan, tired of walking along Satan's streets and boulevards. I trust that you'll come home tonight. And if you're here tonight as a child of God, you have not been a faithful Christian, you ought to repent of your sins, ask the Lord's forgiveness, confess your faults one to another. Lord, I've wandered far from God, but tonight, this night, which may be the only night I will have left, I'm coming home. Won't you come now as we stand and sing?